of just displaying the whole table. You already figure out which columns you want to show and what you want to put in there. Okay, so write the, temp the, the custom template or pull the, put them in the table, but pull them out before they're displayed. Right. And then put the, create whatever text I want on the headers above the table. So does the dis decision about what to exclude from a column depend on the data set that's returned? No, it's always the same columns that you want to exclude from the result. Right. And they come, so like, the column A and B are constant. Over that. I'll just take out column A and B. I can do that with CSS, and then move them up to the move, create the text appropriate for, the, for those might information in the header. If it's just always those two columns and views, you can just say exclude this column. You might be able to do different views, one which is attached. I mean, different displays. So in the view, create a display with your more or less constant stuff, and then attach your display with more you know, variable stuff to it. You can also look for, if you're comfortable with PHP, you can also look for a, uh, a hook that will just allow you to um, parse in a string into that header area. Um, and what I would do is essentially grab the argument and then just replace the string that you want appearing up there, kind of uh, using the T function, you know, kind of with the tokens. And then that can switch the text a little bit easily. And then the views, the standard views control would take care of the rest of the page there. So that is one of your options as well. And the hook would go in from, the hook would be in which module? Well, unfortunately, being used on module or one of the includes, which is about what, like 150 now? Um, <laughs> do you need it in the header or do you just need it above the table? Above the table. It doesn't okay. have to be yeah. in the header. Okay. okay. Yeah, so if you exclude the fields from the view, it'll still, that the variables will still be available to you in the template file, so you yep. can do whatever you Back want. To the so the, the message just for I hear so far is templates? That would probably get you done quick. And then you can probably look for a much finer okay. solution after. That's sort of what I thought. I just wanted to have a different idea. Excellent. Very Thank good. You. Thank you, everybody who participated. Uh, Kevin, you all set to go? Yeah, I'm ready. I think I'm recording. So we'll, we'll find out. Yeah. All right. Thank we'll you. find out later. OK. Uh, I'm Kevin Wall, uh, CEO of KWall. We do Drupal development. We have offices uh, in Orange County, Scottsdale, Arizona, and Dallas, Texas. And we work with a lot of enterprise clients, such as like PayPal, eBay. ABC, DHL, and do some really cool Drupal applications. We mostly focus on Drupal applications. So today, I'm going to talk about administering Drupal, and everybody says, oh yeah, we know how to do that. I'm going to talk about it more in the fact that you're giving a, somebody a site, or you're providing a site, or you're getting a site, that you have to learn Drupal to administer, which kind of sometimes can be a, a problem. And I can kind of point out some of the issues that we've come across doing hundreds and hundreds of Drupal sites and things that help us overcome those issues that when you start having problems, such as putting something in a view header, uh, you can overcome with your uh, you know, client, end user, and stuff like that. So let me go ahead and just kind of go through my five second slides. So you know, one of the cool things about Drupal is it's really role based, has you know, user architecture, and everything's really on page editable, just kind of by default for pages. So you go in and you give somebody the right permissions, they can edit it, and I can kind of go to an example of that. Uh, there we go. So, you know, for this site, for example, I, you know, I went ahead and logged in, and, you know, it has an edit page, and the first thing people learn how to do when you give them a Drupal site is see that there's an edit button, and go in there and hit edit, and type stuff. Right. You built this for them. I guess to take a step back, how many people here are like developers or provide sites to people? You know, a lot of, okay, and how many people have a Drupal site and are just trying to figure out what to do with it? Okay. <laughs> and, okay, so typically, um, if you're in Drupal 6 or 7 or something like that, you're gonna come in, you're gonna edit on a page, and it's gonna give you, you know, a lot of, like a big body area, and you're gonna be able to put stuff out there, and then, designer developers are gonna put stuff in there all nicely and then you're gonna go in and edit it and it's gonna blow up. And uh, so basically, you've just learned how to use Drupal. Now, part of the downfall of, of teaching somebody Drupal and giving them a site is there's a lot of training, right? You've got content types, you've got blocks, you've got views, you've got everything under the sun that's in this menu. And even if somebody goes to slash admin, and says, okay, 
what, what do I do with this Drupal site? You've got, you know, probably this much stuff you've got. And I don't know if you guys can see that in the back. So I'll try to zoom in a little bit. So you've got a lot of stuff in here that you've got to teach somebody how to use before they can even really get started on their Drupal site. So instead of talk, talking about how somebody in teaching every single client how they, how they use this system and all these different things in there, first step one is um, kind of back up for a second and realize how long it took you to learn how to use Drupal's every little bit of links and things that are in here. And then second, think of um, how you've given them this site. So uh, perhaps maybe when you set up those roles, you weren't necessarily thinking of your client as much as you probably should be. So typically, uh, in a Drupal site, you end up getting you know, the, the anonymous user, which is everyone else, somebody that logs in, uh, somebody's administrator, and then something else, something kind of in between. And what happens is, yeah. So what happens is we build these roles, right? It's about almost every developer or somebody. And the next thing you do is then put the permissions in place. So let me go to a permissions page. Great. Now I've got a million permissions to sign up. And what typically happens is we give a content editor role to our client or end user that's going to administer it. And we've got it all honed in where they can only edit like pages and this content and these pieces and they can't get into the weeds. So we've kind of narrowed out the scope of what Drupal can do. Um, then we add an administrator role that can do everything. And then the one thing we miss here is that there's a big step in between those two roles, right? That you end up getting frustrated because the client needs access to everything that you've not given them. And then you switch them on to the administrator role. And then all of a sudden they've got all this stuff they don't know what to do with. And you've got to train them through each piece of that, how blocks work, how things work. And uh, to kind of take that into perspective, you know, We've got too many links on the page when you go to administration. You know, you've got to teach people a navigation structure that's huge and lots of stuff, and they don't even really understand what half of this stuff is. And probably we don't either, because we just installed a module, and it's a list of stuff you've probably never even gone down. Um, Terminology's kind of weird with blocks, and what are blocks, and where do they go? And uh, every client's going to hit the views and start hitting edit and freak out, because there's a thousand things in the view page. So that's, that's kind of the main things, and then really not understanding what the page is going to look like when they hit edit and then when they hit save. And so I'm going to kind of go over a few ways that we've kind of alleviated ourselves from having um, these same problems with our hundreds of Drupal sites that we're taking out there. Yeah? And you never ever want to give them access to the Right. So uh, the first thing we typically do is we build a real administration dashboard. Almost every site you build is gonna have views installed, right? And you're gonna be able to build stuff. Well, when you just start out, you're gonna be um, you know, taking people to the content list, and it's gonna be you know, confusing, and it's gonna look like this, right? And at first, um, our initial goal when we build Drupal sites is to put as little choice as possible in front of who's using the site. Same thing as if I gave you like, you know, four ways to change your turn signals when you turn right. <laughs> it's gonna be really confusing, you're gonna look at it for a while. I just want you to hit it and go, and take a right turn. So in here, instead of giving you the typical Drupal administration interface for your content, where I have to figure out what type really means, or what status is, and then I have to teach somebody what each of these terms is, what we do is we take a step back and we build uh, basically an administrative interface using a view, and there's one that already comes with it, if you, I believe, uh, even in six and seven, this is a six site, where we can build um, a general structure of a view. So you can already output fields in any way you want in a view, right? And you can have filters to search for things however the client seems to need to know what this stuff is. And in this we build bulk operations because we like to <coughs> add a lot of quick and easy operations, yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about Workbench in a second. Um, but in this idea, you can use like a Workbench where there's some modules that will give you some uh, built-in views to make life easier. So find out what that client or that end user is really going to do with it 
and not only just build a better content list, but maybe build like three. Build one for if they need to manage uh, products in some way. Build one for managing maybe news articles if they need to see half the body content in the news article, but build it in a way that it works better for the user to understand and to get them out of the general Drupal stuff, the stuff that they get confused about. Um, for example, I mean, just turning it into a linear level like this is a lot easier to understand than three separate choices and a filter reset like we looked at just over here, right? So even if I went down here and I knew I wanted a blog post and I filter it, I've got to find a way to come back out, right, and undo. Or There's too much stuff going on here. So just to kind of make that easier for them, we'll put this in place. Uh, another thing that typically gets forgotten is that you can build pages for anything, and you can restrict page content to um, who needs to get to it. So for this, we'll build a management dashboard, which is where maybe we send the admin when he logs in to go to the stuff that they care about. So we, go to, we build one that says, go here for content, go here for SEO, go to the store, do it here, and, and even go down to custom settings, and I don't know if this has a name. Yeah, so like, if we've built custom options, we'll build them into that dashboard menu. Um, one other item that we have typically is um, WebPT, for example, they've got you know a team page, and this is actually built in a view, and it's, it's basically just a list of stuff going down, right? Uh, one thing about this is if we had built this into an, a page where they just hit edit, and they go in, and it's in the table, and it's kind of hard to manage, uh, that might have been too hard for somebody, depending on who's managing the content. Now, I'm not really always talking about the person that can come in and edit anything they want and change CSS and go crazy, but maybe the other person that they're going to assign to manage the content that's sitting around, doesn't know anything about Drupal, spells it wrong, and then goes in and goes crazy. Uh, so in this, we've built out views, and I'll show you a piece of this content where it just lists whoever's down the page. Now, once you've built a view, everybody understands the client's going to say, uh, well, we got this new guy. We fired Paul, and we want them at the top, and, but we want to be able to manage that. And so one thing you can always do is build administrative views that go into your dashboard that allow people to manage things like this. So let me go ahead and I think I've got that dashboard set up here. And so we built a view for them called Manage Biographies, and basically under the team, We've got the people in here. They can come to this dashboard page, see who's who, hit edit. Let's say you have Media Temple and 10,000 employees and you want everybody's picture out here. This would be really nice for you to manage instead of going to content list, trying to find the right person's name, hitting edit, realizing that's like a page somebody made. Um, they can come here, they know it's exactly that content. They can hit edit, manage what they need to, save and it goes back. They can also here, if you install draggable views, you can use a draggable view <laughs> to give people ordering functionality and sort by weights. So you can give them all this functionality that Drupal's giving you and allow them to manage their content so they don't have to come back to you every night and say, I need this tomorrow, I need this, you know, these Heidi switched out to the bottom, she got demoted. And so you can give them this operation for Heidi. And... Um, and, and really get them off your back on, on changing things and managing content. Uh, you know, setting up revisions is another thing that's often overlooked uh, for a variety of, re variety of reasons. Why'd you look at me? Maybe you do. Um, let me go back to the main site here. And so depending on what the content is, you probably want to go into your content types and just make sure that whatever you've set up has, and I'll go into biography here, revisions turned to on under workflow settings. There's going to be a create new revision, and in that content type then going forward, every time something's saved, it creates a revision, right? So it makes a bigger and bigger database of all this stuff that they're going to save. Reason we think that's extremely important for our clients and people that are using the site is when I go in and let's just say I edit this Y Web PT page, and I screw it up. Not, you. Not me. <coughs> Some, but so the bottom of the Drupal down here, we always have a preview button, right? And if I have preview, it doesn't save. 
and the client gets to see what it would look like somehow. But still, it's hard to envision, right? And so what we train a lot of the time is just to ignore that page and, and realize that revisions are available. And so that we reduce the scariness of saving and allow them to go back and go back to what they had before. So just by in, in, enabling a revision step, we get them to get off that preview, scared to change, don't want to change it, going to screw it up. And when they hit save, it saves a new revision on every piece of content that that makes sense on. If I go back here too, if they're a stickler for finding out who did what and see why Rhino blew up this page, we can tell them now and then they don't come to your door asking, why is this screwed up? What happened? I don't know what happened. Well, you can see exactly what happened. And so that's part of what we keep in mind is the simple, simple easy management of each different piece of content. Yeah? Do you occasionally think out the revisions? And if so, what kind of criteria do you use for that? It really depends on the site. And sometimes we don't turn revisions on at all, depending on the type of content. But revisions are going to be very small pieces of data, typically, if it's just a page of content. So you shouldn't really need to worry about clearing out the revisions. Turn it on if you're attaching large files to the page. Well, it depends on what it is. Because however you're saving that content, the file itself isn't technically part of the uh, content, so it very well may just be on the side somewhere. So then you could leave it on. Uh, for example, one site we don't have it on is uh, like this Hungry Howie's Pizza's franchise website's specific locations. This site has each store's each store in here. I just look at Michigan has its own menu of whatever they want. And once I select a location, uh, everything in the menu, you know, down to what type of pizza they have is their own deal. Because it's a franchise, they could say <laughs> anchovy pizzas are all I sell here. And that's fine with us. So with that, there's a ton of data. There's like the price for it, the stuff. Uh, we just make sure we back it up all the time and we don't give, keep revisions. Plus, uh, there's just so much change going on with like 30,000 pizza chains that it's going to make a huge database. Yeah. Along the same lines of this question, um, is it, are you more likely to create a page and make that revision? Or are there certain types of nodes that are better for revisions but not revisions? That's a good question. Um, for the most part, we just default to keeping revisions of everything. Uh, especially one thing that people don't think about is like user profiles. You know, if you're storing, you've got an Ubercart site or something like that, and you're storing all these different members or your social networking site, and you want to keep all their fields together. Um, one thing you don't want to lo lose is that person's information. Later, if for some reason you need it legally or who knows what, and they go to zero it out, it would have been deleted out of your database and out of your files if you didn't keep revision of, like, say, the profile information or whatever you're going to keep. So that's very helpful, and especially if you really, really need to go back. Um, yeah. Do you use revisioning or something along those lines? Yeah, we've done that too. So it depends on how your content really is structured, but in the easiest, most simple way, revisions is kind of built in here ready for you to just use. And if you just can turn that on, it might save you a huge headache later. Um, something else we typically do so that the client's in control of their content and understands where it is, is there is a module called Backup and Migrate. Um, I'm sure Media Temple's amazing, but they might forget to back up your server, and you don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, maybe who, GoDaddy. We'll say GoDaddy forgets to back up your server. <laughs> And so basically, you're relying on them to keep track of what's going on. This will at least store a database file into your root directory of Drupal. And just for example, you can do a schedule. So you can show them that the world's not lost. So we've already given them a revision, so they're not scared to save anymore. Now we're going to tell them that they can back up any time they're scared of destroying their site. So now they've got enough empowerment that they don't have to um, really be scared to do stuff, have bad things happen, and bring it back to life. 
Right. So this one's got a weekly schedule, and it schedules in every week or every day for seven days. It's just going to store seven files of the database. So midnight or whatever, it's going to keep track of those. So that way, if they do destroy everything and then they forget about it, we can still get it back to them as well. So, um, you know, we've kind of built a nice fail-safe process around that just in a couple modules and a default keeping revisions. We keep track of everybody's stuff. We make sure it doesn't go away and can't come back and there's any do-overs, yeah. And you never have a problem using backup and migrate to uh, where it's not totally replicated or something like that? No, not yet. Um, Why do you ask? Uh, yeah, not yet. And in perspective, that's probably installed in 500 sites. So, so far, so good. Um, the one thing it doesn't store is cache data, typically, by default. You, I think you can store it, but yeah. by default, it does not. Um, that's on purpose, because that's the big chunk of stuff that you really don't need. Um, but it, you might, if you're doing crazy things. Yeah, you might want the log files. It also doesn't store log files. Which right. As automated backups, you probably should. Right. But yeah, I think you can turn all that on, but by default it doesn't. Uh, one thing we also suggest is make block management easier. Uh, so let's say we're training somebody or you're just learning how to use your site. And somebody said, okay, well, you go over here and you create content. And then all that stuff that's sitting around on its sides, oh, that's not content, that's a block. And they say, what's a block? And you go, okay, well, let me teach you what a block is. So you teach them about blocks. One problem with blocks is they have to go to this page with their scrolly mouse. And they can like move stuff around, right? You could be like, what is this? I'm crazy. And, and destroy their whole site, right? And so one good way to keep them out of this, if you have a lot of blocks, and this could be in context or really anything, is to get on page editing buttons. There's a lot of ways of doing that. There are certain modules that do that. Um, Press edit, change the content. Same idea as uh, regular page editing. Then I can go visually see what I want. I hit edit. Which, which is good for UI consistency too. Right. So I don't have to go find that content. It's not gone. Uh, it's, it's still there. Yeah, go ahead. You said that's a module? Yeah, what is that module? It's like a, there's a couple. I think... This site specifically, I think, uses node blocks, and I believe that's part of it. Um, that's another thing we do for blocks, is we create, uh, we use a module called node blocks a lot. This also kind of changes the UI a little bit. So um, a module called node blocks, essentially what it does is creates a content type called block that then is used as a block, instead of me going to site building, blocks, add block. I go to create content, block. Here's my block. So it follows this, the, the page issue. One thing with Drupal 6 specifically is that if you go node add block and you create that block of content that I just came in and I typed in, and um, if you're just starting to do Drupal sites and you haven't really dove into modules yet, you would come into input format when you're like, man, that editor's annoying. Let me type in my PHP code, you know, and this makes cool stuff happen. Then, that, then you've made this block, right? In the regular node add block process, it, blocks don't store revisions. So what I was talking about earlier with revisions, in your block, it's not going to store revisions. So you're going to have this block in here, and the client's going to go, I can kind of read PHP. This says if and else, and if I take those brackets out, yeah, it works now. And then you go in, you go, what happened? I didn't store a copy of this block that I made all this crazy PHP code in. It's gone, because they didn't have a revision. They just changed it for you. Um, so putting in like node blocks and then keeping revisions of that block keeps it all kind of in the same UI, content, create content, block. But it also saves you with keeping that revisions on, because you're going to save your content if you've got some crazy PHP code in here doing stuff that you really don't want to go away later. Um, and the client will find it, and they'll change it. 
or somebody will, you know, come and look at it. The uh, so yeah, trying to I think it's Node Blocks. If you go in, that's going to give you some of what they call in content links, and it does an edit and a configure link right here and here, where it sends them to the block edit page. So you can do those page specifics, right? Or you can, and then you're kind of lost. Or you go back to edit, and you change the real content right there. And so it helps a lot with just keeping people visually understanding what they're changing. Yeah. So you you create you, no blocks is a is a model. Right. Thing, is that right. Yes. And so you know how does that manage in the context of the block layout and region? That's still going to follow the same blocks page layout and region so layout. basically appears in that page. Then. Exactly. It creates blocks, but the users don't edit blocks. Right. So you can still edit content. One of the cool things about that, too, is that if I go into my, you know, created view of content, um, I have a type of block. So if they actually wanted to go look at all the blocks lying around on this, I could do that where in the typical block process that would be a separate type of view that you'd have to put together. Right, it's content now. So now it's actually usable in views. And it might be really cool to reuse those blocks in some kind of random display, right? Uh, that'd be a good way of doing it. You're like there's an admin right now. Right. right. So they wouldn't be able to actually create new blocks that would be able to edit the blocks that you set up. It depends on what you set because it's now... Um, you could do clones. Um, in the permissions, I'll show you. Uh, you could set, since it's content types, you right. could be particular to uh, creating content types of block. So we go to, you know, create blog content. So you could turn that off. You could to edit any. You could do, I can only edit my own blocks. You can do a lot of different kind of workflow type of layouts because it is the same as all your other content that you're used to managing. And so it helps to unify all that into one thing, and we do that a lot with all this kind of stuff, because basically um, Blocks is so off-tangent that it takes a whole other section of training. And that's kind of the, the three things we go through, or five things we go through with, with teaching someone Drupal, right, is here's where your content is, here's what it's like, here's where you manage users, here's where you manage Blocks, and don't touch views, or your site will explode. So basically those five things. Sometimes you add a sixth, which is panels, right? Or something else like context, something a little crazier. And uh, so that's where it gets all confusing. There's a lot of things there. You almost have to go through and like teach them a bit at a time, or it just is overwhelming. Um, the more we can turn that into like one thing, the better it works, right? Because then they just have to remember one place. They go, they edit it. That's in my management dashboard. Um, another example of this is uh, this Falcon Northwest site. I don't want this dude calling me every time he wants a new banner, right? So we put into we put in views, we put in an ad link in the in the header of the view, so he doesn't have to go to create content ad. We build little interfaces for them to manage things like this. A good example of that is um, for his desktop features here. You know, there's a big gallery of these. And it looks like this, where they've got, you know, their different systems, and he's got all these. So that's pretty neat, right? Next up, well, how do I make this one end up over here? And this is essentially a view of stuff. Well, hmm, let me make you something that does that. So build a view that is restricted to admins or whatever role that is. And allow them to manage. Let me see what page I put that on here. We'll just go to. I lost it. There it is. So build a view of gallery images that is the different content type of gallery image that's referenced to this type of computer, maybe by taxonomy, um, and then put some draggable views on it. Right? Put that one at the top if he wants. Hit save. 
reorders that for them. And then you can do that by weights downward. So there's a lot of ways of building these administrative types of interfaces or additional menu items that it's going to make life easier for people. And if you find, um, you know, a lot of people struggling with things, create a management dashboard that has that, add a link to it, add some help text, um, write something to the client or the person using it. Uh, it's a lot easier than answering the same question 50 times, right? So like I was saying, we can create an administrative dashboard that's just there for admins. One of the cool things about putting that into menu links on the page is that they're only allowed to see the menu links in Drupal that they have permission to do so, you know? Like when you create a view or something and, and somebody doesn't have permission and it's not in the main menu item, same thing happens with administration features. So if you're just using a menu and you have 12 roles of all these people that are moderators and SEO managers and stuff, and they need to see different stuff, well, they will in the, in the permission set in that menu. So you only create one menu and it'll grow or shrink based on what those kind of people are. I typically suggest, you know, creating content listing views. There's some that you can already use. Um, I was going to show Workbench is one example of, this is a module you can download, uh, you know, kind of a quick and easy dashboard for, like, the content I've edited, all the recent content. You know, you can go and just kind of make an easy-to-use thing. This is kind of something you could just download by default. It's called Workbench. It's just project slash workbench. Right. Um, it'll do things. Let me just do a content list like this one here. You know, similar to this, it'll just kind of put it all on page and then allow you to kind of manage the different content as needed. Um, going kind of back to this, the... You know, a couple things we see a lot of the time. File management is difficult. If you have file content types or image content types, um, build a view of those so people can actually see them on the screen and make it easy for them to find what they're looking for. Um, the SEO links are pretty hidden away sometimes when you add things like page title or different options like that. So you may want to just put those into a dashboard like we have here showing the SEO people that don't quite know Drupal yet that are going to come in after you and look for this stuff in their site and ask you for a list of these different things. You can just give them a link and say, here it is, it's in the dashboard, and give them access to that SEO section. Um, kind of shortcuts to the different sections of Drupal that need to be provided. Um, if you're using, like, you know, e any e-commerce, order management's a big thing. Building out an order view that makes sense is going to be huge. And then there are additional ways of managing users outside of the typical Drupal user management. I think there's just a default uh, user better view that you can put together that, depending on your user's needs, may work a lot better. Um, one thing, if there is a site that gets a lot of orders or gets a lot of spam, you may want to um, download the bulk operations in, it's a view plugin basically, view display that allows you to do different bulk operations on things like users or new nodes. We use this a lot so that we could like bulk send emails to people, block out a ton of people if there was a bunch of spam users or something like that and we train them on that. Um, one thing I would also say kind of to your point with view management is, you know, one of the reasons that people get worried when they get to a view is it looks crazy, right? They accidentally hit that edit button and it has all this stuff and these displays. But the one thing they do want to do is get to that header or that footer, right? And you've put a bunch of content in there and it looks great. But one thing you can do to keep people out of this and keep them on page is when I kind of went back to talking about the editing of blocks is there's no reason you couldn't just use PHP code and put a block in there, print out a block that's in your back end that's not being displayed somewhere, and allow that edit configure links to be in that. So when you're in this view, you're going to have a block embedded in this header, so it's going to show up in that header however you want, 
and you can just basically keep them out of the view by having edit and configure links right there on that section of content. Um, so, um, so a couple other things we do just for fun for people is we'll make sure that they have a style guide so they understand what their types of content are going to look like just in their um, section we just build out a list of stuff and show it in its own CSS style um, the other thing we do is we make sure that depending on what editor you're using. The CSS for this editor is the same as the site, right? Because that's a lot of the time where they're typing in here and it's just this default, you know, Arial or something. It's not matching up to what they want it to see. And they start getting frustrated and it doesn't look the same. Make sure that's always uh, the same CSS styles that are coming out on the site, yeah. So there's, we use TinyMCE a lot because it's the most comfortable for most of our clients to use. We used to use SEK Editor, but we, we quickly moved out of that um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, so, so far, so good on TinyMCE. I'd be open to anybody else suggesting other editors they use if anybody's using other ones. Yeah, it's basically the two. It's TinyMCE, or it's now just CK Editor. Right. They bounce back and forth. Uh, I'd say TinyMC is the one we use primarily by default because people just seem to really get understand the interface a little bit better. And uh, if you're not using the like what you see is what you get main editor module that allows you to do different editors for the different types of text, you should be doing that because that keeps editors off of things that shouldn't have editors and only the people that need them have editors. Uh, plus then you can edit specific content types to have specific things. Yeah, it's these are all plugins of another open source system and they're not 100% tested. Um, so some of them may not work the best. And so you just take it down to what you really need. Um, HTML block format here is usually not checked, but if you check that, and I go back to this page, um, that's this here, where it's paragraph, heading two, three, whatever. Um, you can put your own, you know, styles. If you have a class called, like, amazingly large text, you know, you can put them in there, and then it'll show up like that. So it makes editing uh, really, really nice and simple. That is just the WYSIWYG module. And that's basically just a framework to apply what you see is what you get editors to. Um, that started in Drupal 6. They had. And there's finally some pretty decent tutorials on how to do those. Right. There didn't used to be at all. There was every editor for themselves going on in the module. Yeah. So, like, FCK editor and this editor and that editor were all doing the same thing and all, like, basically not working oh. together to, to put it together and make a good deal, and since Drupal's about working together and making things work right, uh, we kind of just ended up with what you see is what you get being the framework to inject editors in as needed. And that doesn't mean you couldn't just use a different editor for the different types of content. You could even build a different input formats if you need to. Um, one thing we also talk about in content management is there's a lot of times where PHP code ends up having to be done. And um, one of the problems that you can have is putting it in blocks like I was talking about. And if you haven't tried to just build a block that just magically appears out of a module, you should try it. It's really not that hard. And it'll help you basically have a block that mystically shows up, kind of like a view block that you can't really change in there, but exists and does stuff and get it out of somebody's hands of going in like, like I was talking about and changing that uh, PHP code on you or, or even having somehow further down the line some sort of security implications because you left it on page instead of in a file.
and that's pretty much what I've got today. <laughs> if you have any questions for me, um, shoot away. Uh, how do you handle uh, uh, like security issues? Looking, uh, do you encounter things where there's any vulnerabilities in Drupal and patches need to be applied? Yeah, well, um, so as you can see, a lot of these sites have some sort of security update. So we do a lot of sites. So we have a process where we go through and evaluate uh, what modules need to be updated, and then they, they go on a schedule. So we don't, every one of the apps that's part of this process has the opportunity to just have that be updated as it goes. Um, one thing that can invite you is if you don't back everything up and you save it and you update the modules and uh, let's say you update Drupal from 6.2.0 to 6.2.2 and it destroys all your block layouts because that actually is happening. Um, you need to back it up until you go back. Uh, so we have a team that just goes through that process and helps. Do you, do you guys ever release just a security update? Yes, uh, okay. absolutely. So depending on what the modules need, but we will test it out on something first and then we go through the whole process. So. We're probably a little bit more strict on that than most people. Are there any modules that have been kind of risky that you don't use? Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I could list them all, but there are some, but most of the Drupal modules are fairly secure to a point. No. Yeah, I mean, to a point. They're there's, not, I mean, thousands, I, there's thousands of them. And there, there are, are some are security risks. Issues. I but, know what you're saying. But yeah. That would this isn't uh, Wild West. I mean, there are people keeping an eye on stuff, and but that takes really everybody. That takes when we find something that, that shouldn't have been done the right way. The really common ones sure. that most people use are tend to be fairly stuff most people are going to run into. You yeah. know, views, block, whatever, no blocks I talk about. They're going to be fairly mature modules. They've been around a long time. They've been upgraded to, to different versions from four, five, six, and seven through full. So they're going to work pretty well. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not going to have bugs and not get exactly what you want. But security-wise, you'll typically see a module that has a big security issue disappear from Drupal.org. And if you do see that, <laughs> or it says not supported anymore in your module list, you can go find out why. And it might be something that could get your site hacked. Um, it's not that common to have something. Like usually that got, a, a module may have a bug. Right. It gets patched. Right. And that's, that's it for that one. Yeah, and there is a, a security team with Drupal.org that does try to. And, and some would argue that most of the programmers, most of the core people that do a lot of Drupal programming, lean really hard towards security, which makes it really unfriendly to get started. Yes, yeah. so, so I, I would say that's probably one of the drawbacks in, 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 with Drupal. I mean, Drupal security is. That there is security. There is security. <laughs> that. I mean, there's, there's been an ongoing debate for for years. Is you know, it's like why can't I just install Drupal? And, why, why won't Drupal install my database? Well? Mm -hmm. Right. And that, this was one of the first applications that I came across open source PHP. Is, what do you? How do I install database? Right. I mean. And well, one of the differences now with Drupal seven is, for example, this has probably got something to update. I mean, the more stuff you find and you pile into your site, the more updates it's going to ask for. And the easiest thing for you to do, even though there are security risks to leaving stuff with security updates, is to just put a plan around scheduling those out. Or you're just going to do it on the, on the random. And then when some bug does appear because some module is updated and it's slightly different, it's best to just have that all happen at once when you're ready for it, then where you take off to Alaska and don't theme your site, and then something bad happens. Hey. And uh, so let's look at available updates. Or Mexico. <laughs> um, so now in Drupal 7, you can install new modules or you know run updates and download them, right? So that's a nice feature that has been added on that. So it does make it a little bit easier. So well, you can tell it update all modules. Yeah, so I could say these, this, these are the modules that this site specifically needs. And I can say go for it. And if it has the right credentials, it can log in, it can download them to the site and set them up. And uh, it does take your site off. It does a, a really good process on that. One of the things, though, is if you're getting started out and you said, hmm, 
I really would like another um, div or some, a dash between this and the Drupal something token module, and you went in and, and edited to that module, it would uh, blow that edit away because it's going to update the whole module, which is kind of the point. Yeah? It, I don't believe it does the backups to that. Right. Yeah. So you'll end up having to do that yourself. And really, uh, it, most people use Drush for updates. It just takes two seconds to run an update, right? Yeah. It depends on how we set it up. But typically, we take out status messages such as that for the lower users because there's not there's maybe like three days of the month that it, something doesn't need an update or if, some if message. You're one about it, it, it takes out the scariness factor. For right. Because really, most of the security updates are pretty minimal. And, but, yeah, it can scare the heck out of a client. Right. And if you've got 20 clients, it's pretty right. hard to warn. Yeah. So, so there's certain messages that you cannot easily get out based on permissions depending on what you want to give people access to. For example, in Drupal 6, uh, logs and messages are heavily tied together. So there's some messages that will be difficult for you to get to without um, adjusting something in the modules and or adjusting things like that. Um, there is a, a different, if you're in Drupal 6, there's a module called Better Messages that you can use to hone in and change messages however you'd like. I don't know where it is on this. Go look it up. Better Messages, it's pretty good. I don't know if it's on that site. There. So you can like make big pop-up messages that are really annoying too with Better Messages. Um, in Drupal 7 too, there's a really cool one that does like a if you use Mac and there's a growl where it pops things up and, and notifies you kind of and floats away, there's a really cool module that does that too. So you, in this one you can kind of add messages and they pop up and you can add animations where they fade in and out and make it all kind of fancy, kind of take it away from that. Uh, one of the things that some people use better messages for is because it takes it kind of out of the theme and you know how you always kind of kind of manage where your messages show up in your theme because they show up in that big box somewhere. Um, if you use better messages because it basically puts a light box on top, it's going to take those out of the theme and then place them out for view, which might be helpful if you're theming or kind of around messages and you don't expect them. Anybody else? Uh, I noticed you have a lot of images and blocks and stuff like that. Do you have a strategy for uh, preventing people from putting like a 4,000 pixel image in a you know, block or something like that? I mean, yeah, um, well, it depends on the type of site, but most of the time things are image cached. And we'll use like upload fields, and if you don't know what image cache is, um, basically it allows you to create different sized images based on the uploaded image. And so let me just pick one. Of these sites, I bet. In WYSIWYG areas, sometimes we'll just uh, let them go crazy. Uh, it really depends. And, you know, uh, so for people that don't use image cache, if you're like building views, like you saw that view I had with all the people's profiles, we just allow them to upload whatever they want. And then we use image cache to create that right size for that biography view. And in the view, you can select image cache types of sizes. So here you can see there's a biography size. And if I hit edit, um, it, and it has a little cool Drupal guy, it says, you know, I've got it scaling and cropping. So it's going to scale down to this big. And then there's still stuff around it. So it's going to crop that out and just put this in there at this size. So you can do that kind of stuff where if somebody's uploading a piece of content, you can make it exactly what you want, and then you don't have to manage with a site with all kinds of stuff. Is that how you put the round corners on those graphics? Uh, most likely, yeah. It's probably set up in there. Yeah. Um, 
So, right. Right. So, so if you just install image cache and you start managing it, image cache is dumb. It's like a computer; it's all dumb until you tell it what you want. So, uh, by default, it's just going to take the center or however that's cropped and scaled. And so that person could fall off of there. Um, for example, this is a really good example site for something like that to happen is um, this East Coast like migrate gathering site where they have all this stuff, right? They have stool and benches that are like this big that need to go into these. So there's a little bit of playing around with images for them if they've got a really weird format. And we typically have a document that says you should probably make these at least this size and look out for this. But uh, there will be some trial and error. There's also plugins you can install for image cache that allows them to kind of move the cropping around. And then you can be uh, giving them a little bit better interface for managing that. Uh, yeah, image crop. There's something crazy. With a node block? Yeah. 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 It's just a piece of content after it's set up, so you can. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's cool, huh? <coughs> one, can, I, can I add real quick? Uh, one of the biggest takeaways, I think, from, from tonight, I hope everybody gets, is uh, most of us are really used to adding modules 